So it's a library which includes some indigenous poetry in some form, even if only in the form of an informant. And it includes some of that scholarly fantasy, which I've argued lies behind the Brutus legend. And it includes a new kind of hagiography, a new kind of literature about the saints. A literature which is some way removed from the kind of source that Gildas, for example, or even Bede uses about the saints. St. Germanus and St. Patrick are, in the Historia Britonum, almost indistinguishable. They are standard-issue saints. They go around performing wonders and rebuking tyrants, which is what saints do, but not very specifically. Oh, so you think I'm a saint, Rowan? That's so sweet. Thank you so much. <laughs> It is a quite brilliant work. It's written with immense energy and imagination, and even occasionally wit. It's completely unscrupulous in its use of sources. It simply fabricates. It's a great historical novel. It plunders the work of classical historians, and it shakes out a bag full of names from Welsh genealogies and organizes them in completely arbitrary patterns as king lists from ancient Britain. It's written with immense energy and imagination, and even occasional wit. It's completely unscrupulous in its use of sources. It simply fabricates. It's a great historical novel. It plunders the work of classical historians. <laughs> it sounds like you're talking about yourself again, Rowan. <laughs> So I'll bid you good evening then, Rowan. It's the 11th of November 2016 and it's about 11 o'clock. And I started making this video about an hour and a half ago, um, but I've had to keep redoing it because of all the racket people are deliberately making um, to try and wind me up and upset me. They call this help because they're fucked up in the head, basically. <laughs> They wouldn't be allowed to treat an animal like this um, and I'd like to let them know as well as you that I'm never going to let this go and there'll be more people in jail than you and your perverted associates by the time I've finished um, because if anybody thinks they're getting away with torturing me to death for eight years and these complete and utter scumbags who've been doing it, they're not getting away with it. I can assure you of that. I can assure you all of that. You are not getting away with it. <laughs> anyway, so the clips I've been talking about already, um, they're from a lecture that you gave at the British Library on the 17th of October 2016. Um, and you gave a series of three lectures, and this is the final lecture. I'll probably come on to talking about the other two as well um, but they were only uploaded onto youtube yesterday so i don't know a lot about the period of history that you're talking about in english history really well british history um from about the sixth to the ninth century mainly you're talking about and uh, certain named writers who were around in that period um so without further ado because um i shall be up into the middle of the night um, and I want to finish before they start making a flaming racket again. <laughs> so I've had to come in the kitchen anyway, uh, but then they caused my cat to start making a racket. <laughs> so they do this all the time and then they get really loud engines so I can hear them even in here as well. I never get a minute's peace. It's just this harassment or the fear that it's going to start again 100% of the time. Um, and then, of course, some stuck-up twats uh, who think they're experts in human motivation, identity, behaviour, and so on, keep inventing new reasons why I'm upset because they just won't accept that being tortured to death 100% of the time is upsetting enough by itself. <laughs> 
And if people think they're going to get away with this or they're just going to waltz into my life after all they've put me through, they've got another thing coming. <laughs> they can go fuck themselves along with you. So, um, here's what you're saying in another part of this lecture. If there's anything to be learned from this trawling of otherwise unknown and abidingly obscure British libraries in the post-Roman period, I suppose it might be broken down into two elements. The one is very obvious, and that is that Britishness is always a project, always something which involves imagination and, yes, invention. Um, so you're talking about what these writers um, are saying, and later you come on to talk about how they identify the British people or the English people. The British people you're referring to in this lecture are the ancient Britons who today tend to be called Celts in Wales and Scotland and Cornwall um, and also in Ireland but uh, you're not really talking about the situation in Ireland. Um, but these people were previously known as the ancient Britons and they only became known as Celts, I believe, in about the 17th or 18th century. Um, but previously they were the original indigenous Britons. And then the Angles and Saxons and Jutes invaded, kind of around the time that you're talking about, really. They were setting up in England at that time. So when you talk about Britishness and Englishness, it's um, the people in Wales and Scotland mainly as the British, the ancient Britons, and uh, the English, the Anglo-Saxons Anglo mainly, who invaded and then settled. So the one thing is very obvious, and that is that Britishness is always a project, always something which involves imagination, and yes, invention. So if you, you do refer to Brexit, actually, in this briefly, <laughs> not in the part that I'm quoting, uh, but I'm not too sure how much Britishness today <laughs> involves imagination and invention because, um, I mean, well, yeah, there's quite a lot of immigrants, but they're not really invaders, are they? That they're <laughs> quite a lot of people whose ancestors have come over here in the last few decades. Uh, but I don't know, well, I don't know how they feel about it particularly, uh, but um, for, certainly for myself and for other British people I come across, uh, they don't seem to be quite that obsessed with Britishness, really. I mean, it's just how we are. <laughs> it's just where we happen to be born, and obviously that brings a certain culture and language with it, and customs, and etiquette, and that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> It doesn't, that doesn't really involve much imagination and invention because, I mean, if you were born here, particularly if you were born here to British parents, to, like, indigenous uh, British parents particularly, I mean, I can't speak so much for people whose recent ancestors um, moved into Britain, but uh, people who've been here for generations and generations, I really don't know how much imagination and invention... <laughs> There is in Britishness. <laughs> in any case, this is just like collectivism, isn't it? Because uh, I don't really um, personally spend a lot of time thinking about being British. <laughs> I just kind of take it for granted, really. You know, I am who I am and I happen to be born in Britain and that brings certain things like culture and language and so on, a certain climate... <laughs> So um, I don't know why that involves imagination and invention. Of course, if you're wanting to be shifting the culture of Britain, then you need to come up with in ingenious ways of doing that, don't you? Um, so you would be invested in imagination and invention, wouldn't you? Because you want to be shifting uh, British culture towards globalism. <laughs> Because in your mind, there's only two options. You're either in this one um, oozy, 
group globalist hug all singing Kumbaya and pretending it's all um, sunshine and flowers. Or your goose stepping down the mall, <laughs> shouting Heil Hitler and <laughs> anything in between, according to you. Uh, well, the, that's the way you present it. And also, there aren't any other alternatives either, because um, nationalism is only another form of collectivism. <laughs> And you are the collectivist, and you just can't seem to think outside this collectivist box at all. And you have got political reasons for that, like you're promoting the agenda of the New World Order. That's your political reasons, and you think Stalinist dictatorships are a really great thing. <laughs> But, you, I mean, you've got personal reasons for that as well, as I've mentioned before, uh, that you won't accept the individual, you'll only accept the collective. Um, and this is because you want to avoid taking personal responsibility for all the evil things that you've done and that you're still doing. Um, and so you promote this collectivist idea that it's the system that's corrupt. Um, and this is the reason why you happen to be the one doing these evil things. <laughs> and it's just this corrupt system and this fallen sinful world and this kind of thing. Uh, because you won't take responsibility for the evil things that you do. Um, so when you're supposed to be a genius and fantastic theologian and very close to God and all that kind of thing, you don't seem to have any problem. <laughs> thinking individualistically then uh, but when it comes to me taking responsibility for your evil actions and intentions then all of a sudden we're all in the collective and you don't have any personal responsibility uh, so i don't know why britishness would need today particularly and particularly for people whose ancestors have been here for generations and generations would need uh, imagination and invention. <laughs> I just don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it didn't take a lot of imagination or invention to be born here and to grow up in this culture speaking English. <laughs> And also, I mean, uh, there isn't just a British identity, is there? Even if you're thinking in a more collective way, because um, even in England, um, it's divided into regions and people really are very strongly identified uh, with their region. I mean, Yorkshire is a particularly good example of that, uh, that uh, people in Yorkshire... <laughs> are often quite nationalistic about Yorkshire and uh, we have our own dialect and our own food <laughs> and this kind of thing. Um, so people in Yorkshire tend to be really proud of being from Yorkshire um, and happen Yorkshire just happens to be in England. That's more what it's like. And then obviously you've got Scotland and Wales, which are different nations anyway. So... <laughs> So, I, I just don't know what you're talking about. Personally, it doesn't involve a lot of imagination and invention at all. <laughs> you just have to deal with it, really. <laughs> it involves looking for analogues in the classical or the scriptural tradition. Um, so, you talk a bit later on about the fact that these writers that you're talking about, who you do mention by name, um, identify Britons, ancient Britons and the English, Anglo-Saxons, um, who Christianity um, had just really come into Britain and was um, spreading about and becoming uh, more established, shall we say, through this period. And so you're talking about these writers um, creating kind of Englishness and Britishness as um, being identified with the chosen people of ancient Israel, who are the Jews. Um, so they were being chosen by God in the minds of these writers because um, Christianity, pe more people were converting to Christianity and practicing Christianity. So these two writers were trying to identify um, ancient, um, the British, and uh, English uh, with ancient Israel. 
Um, and also, they still do that really in Wales today. I found when I was there in the Anglican Church in the 90s, um, that there was this identification um, with ancient Israel among Anglicans, at least, in Wales. I don't know about other Christians. Um, that um, because God chose a small nation, uh, ancient Israel or the Jews, in order to achieve great things in the world, and Wales is also a small nation, so um, God can also choose the people of Wales to achieve great things in the world. So it's not about the size of your nation, really, what you're able to achieve and the people of your nations are able to achieve. So there was still this identification, uh, in Anglicanism at least in Wales, with ancient Israel uh, when I was there in the 1990s. So I don't know how it is today. <laughs> so this is what they were how they were describing um, Britons and English people around this time. So you say, it involves finding a narrative, that's as true now as it was then, and one of the dangers against which we need to keep watch is the danger of supposing that there is an absolutely given, clear and authoritative narrative about what it is to be British, which was never invented or created or refined by any historian or poet at all. History suggests the contrary. <laughs> so you're being a bit melodramatic here, aren't you, when you're talking um, about <laughs> the need to keep watch <laughs> because there's a danger. And the danger is thinking that there's um, an absolutely given clear and authoritative narrative about what it is to be British. Well, why is that a danger anyway, even if somebody thinks that? And I, I really don't think that um, anyone thinks that a national identity is a very concrete thing, uh, because most of us realise that we're individuals in a nation anyway. <laughs> and as I've said, uh, Britain is quite divided um, anyway uh, in the way that people define themselves and their identity tends to come from their region or separate nation, uh, particu particularly the region in England. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who you could possibly be talking about. I think you've uh, set up this um, situation uh, which doesn't actually exist. You've, uh, <laughs> you do this quite frequently. <laughs> Actually, I've mentioned it before, uh, but you're warning us of a danger <laughs> that doesn't actually exist because I don't know that anyone actually thinks like this, that there's an absolutely given clear and authoritative narrative about what it is to be British, which was never invented or created or refined by any historian or poet at all. Uh, so, well, in a sense, like every British person is creating the narrative as to what it is to be British, aren't they? Because they've got their own understanding of it and how they operate within Britain and British culture. Uh, so I don't really know what you're talking about. I think you're making this up. <laughs> so you say, at the same time, a second point is worth bearing in mind. For all the awkwardness of the language used by Gildas and Bede about the functional identity of a Christian race, British or Anglo-Saxon, with ancient Israel. This is what I've just mentioned. Both of them, Gildas insistently, Bede increasingly as he grew older. Both those historians, both of them, see the chosenness of this Christian people as a cause, not for self-congratulation, but for deep self-examination. Uh, well, you could stop self-congratulating, couldn't you, and start deep self-examination. I think that would be a good place for you to start, Rowan. <laughs> so why don't you personally take their advice? Um, and I don't suppose that um, these people were speaking in the collective either, because um, collectivism isn't a teaching of Christianity in any tradition. <laughs> People are personally responsible um, for their own actions and um, they're not responsible for other people's actions. Maybe you could say 
um, that a, a parent was responsible for a child, um, as particularly a small child who wasn't able to raise them yet. Uh, but um, it's not a teaching of Christianity that anybody is responsible for anybody else's actions. <laughs> So why don't you stop self-congratulating, <laughs> you narcissistic scumbag, and start some self-examination. Uh, just think about all the lies that you tell all the time and your constant self-promotion and trying to manipulate the outcome you want in every situation. Uh, so you say, it's a story not of unbroken success and victory, but a story of failure and betrayal repentance and restoration um, so you're saying this quite emotionally as well um, so <laughs> I'm thinking you're not talking really about uh, the early middle ages in Britain are you you're reflecting on this somewhat more personally um, so um, it's not it's a story not of unbroken success and victory but a story of failure and betrayal repentance and restoration um, so well you're a failure aren't you because uh, you pretend that you're a Christian and you're not a Christian you've sold your soul to Satan and the way that you're going you're on the road to hell <laughs> so I'm not laughing because you're going to hell I'm just laughing because <laughs> you do everything you can to avoid taking responsibility for your actions and you'd rather burn in hell than do that which is just the most ridiculous thing. So your story is not a story of unbroken success and victory, <laughs> but a story of failure. Well, you've consistently failed to get what you want out of me, haven't you? And betrayal. Well, you've betrayed me as well, haven't you? Um, it's real treachery um, that you've done against me. And also, I mean, you're a traitor within Britain as well, if you want to put it that way, uh, because you're the enemy within and <laughs> working against the interests of the vast majority of British people uh, in order to bring in the new world order who want to exterminate us all. So it's a story of failure and betrayal, repentance and restoration. Well, I've not seen any repentance from you at all. And uh, even if I did, that doesn't mean I have to be involved with you. You have no right to be demanding that your victims be involved with you. So that's what you mean by restoration. Forget it. Um, so you then say, all national histories find it very difficult to cope with themes of repentance and restoration. <laughs> I don't know how true this is. I don't know why nations would be repenting anyway because um, there's no such thing as collective guilt. This is a fascist concept, as I've said before. Um, and take the Iraq war, for example, which I've referred to before. Um, the government decided to invade Iraq. The majority of British people were against this war. Um, and so... Although it was a bad thing uh, that the British government decided to invade Iraq, then the people who weren't supporting that are not responsible for it, are they? Uh, because I certainly didn't consent to the British government invading Iraq, and I didn't consent to my money being used to pay for it either. Um, so I'm not responsible for that action because I didn't consent to that. I didn't engineer it. And also, of course, you were providing propaganda, uh, which ultimately led to it with all the lies that you were telling about 9-11 back then and that you've continued um, to tell for the years um, that have followed that as well. <laughs> and you were still denying you lied about it when I confronted you in 2014. Um, so you need to repent, don't you? Um, about all those people who were killed um, in the Iraq war and the invasion of Afghanistan because your lies contributed to that. But the British people who didn't support the war and didn't want their money spent on it, they don't need to repent of it, do they? Because they didn't do it. Uh, so you did it. We didn't do it. So you need to repent. 
Um, so there's no such thing as national repentance and collective guilt and all this kind of thing. You talked about this kind of thing all before as well when you were talking about the financial crisis. We need to be repenting of that. We need to be repenting of the ecological disaster that you kept um, melodramatically talking about and about global warming and all this kind of thing although the majority of people are staying at home for most of the year and just living ordinary lives while you were flying around the world and owning several houses <laughs> so you are emitting all this carbon dioxide and telling other people to repent of it <laughs> So uh, you're just completely insane and you're just like controlling everybody and pretending that you're superior and that you're some kind of messiah. You're going to save us all uh, from global warming and poverty and all these other uh, <laughs> things that you've fabricated to make yourself feel important. So you then say they're comfortable with absolute victory or absolute defeat, absolute triumph or absolute victimhood. Uh, well, let's talk about you personally here, Rowan, because you tend to refer to quite personal things in global statements, don't you? Uh, so you, for over two decades, have been trying to get absolute victory over me, haven't you? You've been trying to bring me absolutely under your control and absolutely defeat me, and you wanted absolute triumph and I am the absolute victim in that because I never wanted anything to do with you at all I never um, did anything wrong to you I never, <laughs> I never did anything but of course I made you feel threatened because I was so competent and well thought of um, and so that made you feel threatened and then you tried to screw me and I refused you um, and then you decided you were going to absolutely destroy me by doing all of these things everywhere so you wanted absolute triumph you wanted to absolutely defeat me and i'm the absolute victim um so this is how it is rowan there's no give or take of this or six of one and half a dozen of the other there's nothing like that you are 100 percent to blame for this situation um it, this was all your choice. It was nothing to do with me. I never wanted anything to do with you. I didn't even know all of this was going on for 15 years. Uh, so I'm um, the absolute victim and you're the absolute abuser, the absolute perpetrator. So you say, paradoxically enough, the models around in Gildas and Bede and to a lesser extent even in Minyas are models that suggest that the creation of national and corporate identity does not necessarily leave out of account the need to confront failure, the need to consider what repentance might mean, and the need for narratives of hope and forgiveness. <laughs> models that suggest that the creation of a national and corporate identity does not necessarily leave out of account, the need to confront failure, the need to consider what repentance might mean, and the need for narratives of hope and forgiveness. Um, you say this quite emotionally as well, I recall. The need to confront failure. Well, you confront your failure, Rowan. The need to consider what repentance might mean. Well, what it means, Rowan, is that you um, accept the evil things that you've done and that you stop doing them. That's what repentance means. Or you at least make the intention to stop doing them. Well, whereas all you've got is the intention to manipulate or bully the outcome that you want. What repentance might mean and the need for narratives of hope and forgiveness. Uh, well, if you turn to Christ and repent of your sins, you, you'll inherit eternal life. Um, that doesn't mean you get to destroy me or get to be involved with me in any way whatever uh, that's not part of the bargain <laughs> so that's what a narrative of hope and forgiveness means turn to christ and repent of your sins and stop trying to get involved with me i don't want anything to do with you uh, you don't need to be involved with me in order um, to achieve salvation you i'm not relevant to the issue at all uh, so 
Just forget about me. I don't want anything to do with you. Turn to Christ and repent of your sins and you'll inherit eternal life. So that's the narrative for hope and forgiveness. And so this brief set of reflections on the libraries of post-Roman Britain may perhaps leave us with a few interesting questions about what our own libraries are thinking about national identity, even about national moral horizons. But that's a question I'm happy to leave you with. And that's the end of um, the lecture. So national identity, even about national moral horizons. Um, I'm not too sure what that means. How do you have national morals? I mean, I suppose you have certain moral uh, standards in various societies. They might differ from one society to another. National moral horizons. Um, so you like to be discussing the collective, don't you? So that you can avoid accepting personal responsibility. So I'm glad you're leaving us with this question because you need to be considering your own morality, don't you? You need to be considering your own behaviour and all the evil things that you've done and stop making excuses for it and blaming other people and saying it's just a corrupt, fallen world and all this kind of thing. Stop making excuses and take responsibility for your own behaviour. That's a good place to start. Anyway, I'm going to finish this video now because I'm tired of standing in the kitchen. <laughs> And if my neighbours are making a noise tonight, I'm going to go and hammer their door down again uh, because they've only moved in there to harass me and they've been doing this to me for 12 years, moving people in next door to me um, just to make my life complete and utter misery. And then a bunch of stuck-up middle-class twats uh, make up some cock and bull story that I'm really upset about something else. Um, so I'd really ideally like to have these scumbags moving next door to them <laughs> and see how they feel about it and whether they're really upset about other things or whether they're being upset about being harassed and terrorised 100% of the time. Um, so anyway, I will leave it there. Oh, but before I do that, um, I wanted to congratulate you this week because you'll be celebrating, won't you, at the political success of your idol <laughs> in the US elections. I know you're going to be so thrilled <laughs> with the outcome of the US elections. Um, and in fact, I knew you were going to be so thrilled about it that I've put a clip in about it from your happy birthday video which i did on the 14th of june because that's your birthday and you actually share the same birthday not only with Che Guevara, <laughs> but also with donald trump who's your real political idol so i've put that little clip in there again and obviously um I'm still saving myself for my beloved as well because he's so wonderful and we're meant for each other and uh, I just can't wait to be with him as soon as you're in prison and then we'll be together forever. <laughs> we're just going to be so loved up. It's going to be so wonderful. Anyway, I've got to go to sleep now because, um, well, I need to do this video. Then I need to go to sleep and dream about my beloved all night long. And if my neighbours cause me any problems, I'm just going to hammer on their door all night long until they shut the fuck up. They only moved in to cause me problems and I've had enough of it <laughs> so that's how it's going to be so I'll leave it there for now but don't worry you've taught plenty more shit uh, for me to be getting on with uh, so even if you never utter another word there's still plenty to be going on with and of course I'll be turning up to arrest you so be alert hasta la proxima But if there's anything to be learned from this trawling of otherwise unknown and abidingly obscure British libraries in the post-Roman period, I suppose it might be broken down into two elements. The one is very obvious, and that is that Britishness is always a project, 
or with something which involves imagination and, yes, invention. It involves looking for analogues in the classical or the scriptural tradition. It involves finding a narrative. That's as true now as it was then. And one of the dangers against which we need to keep watch is the danger of supposing that there is an absolutely given, clear and authoritative narrative about what it is to be British, which was never invented or created or refined by any historian or poet at all. History suggests the contrary. At the same time, a second point is worth bearing in mind. For all the awkwardness of the language used by Gildas and Bede about the functional identity of a Christian race, British or Anglo-Saxon, with ancient Israel, both of them, Gildas consistently, Bede increasingly as he grew older, both those historians see the chosenness of this Christian chosen people as a cause not for self-congratulation, but for deep self-examination. It's a story not of unbroken success and victory, but a story of failure and betrayal, repentance and restoration. All national histories find it very difficult to cope with themes of repentance and restoration. They're comfortable with absolute victory or absolute defeat, absolute triumph or absolute victimhood. Paradoxically enough, the models around in Gildas and Bede, and to a lesser extent even in Nennius, are models that suggest that the creation of national and corporate identity does not necessarily leave out of account the need to confront failure, the need to consider what repentance might mean, and the need for narratives of hope and forgiveness. And so this brief set of reflections on the libraries of post-Roman Britain may perhaps leave us with a few interesting questions about what our own libraries are in thinking about national identity, even about national moral horizons. But that's a question I'm happy to leave you with. Had more money. Happy birthday. Your life's so sad, it's funny. Happy birthday. How much more can you take? But your friends are hungry, so just cut the stupid cake.